Southwest Missouri State University Department of Geography Geology presents Land and Life in the Ozarks. This course is one of several units of study offered in Ozark Regional Studies at SMSU and is designed to enhance appreciation of the cultural heritage of this region. In this lecture and the one to follow, I'll be talking about the agricultural systems and types of farming in the Ozarks. Since agriculture is probably the most powerful modifier of the Earth's surface and uh, shaper of the cultural landscape, it is deserving of our attention. In these two lectures, I'll be talking about the specific types of farming that have been attempted or are still going on in the Ozarks and I'll attempt to arrange these in uh, somewhat uh, their chronological order uh, and uh, offer some explanations for the relative uh, increase or decline of these systems of agriculture. It really is interesting that the Ozarks has had a large number of different systems of farming's, uh, farming activities uh, attempted. Uh, part of this may be a response to the fact that the Ozarks offers limited, limited possibilities for agriculture in terms of slopes and soils. Uh, specifically, I'll be talking about uh, uh, nine different types of agriculture, which I'll simply uh, enumerate for you. Uh, first will be specialized crop farming or cash crop farming, then pioneer subsistence farms, general farms, fruit farms, truck farming, dairy farming, poultry farming, livestock farming, and part-time farming. Uh, anytime you attempt to explain, I suppose, any economic activity, including uh, farming activity, you really need uh, more time than, than we're going to have in this hour's presentation, the two half-hour programs. But I have a identified what I think are five especially important uh, factors that uh, have influenced or helped to shape uh, agriculture in the Ozarks. One of these is simply the development of transportation. Now, this is not unique to the Ozarks, certainly, and has had uh, broad implications uh, throughout the United States. Uh, a second factor would be the mechanization of agriculture, which is also a nationwide and worldwide uh, uh, has had worldwide and nationwide impact on agriculture. A third factor would be specialization in agriculture as opposed to the uh, general farm approach to farming. Uh, another factor, or fourth factor, would be the increasingly footloose nature of uh, livestock production and uh, poultry production. Uh, no longer uh, are these activities as dependent on local supplies of feed, and so uh, cost of land, uh, cost of labor are uh, relatively more important than they were in previous times. And finally, then, simply the economies of scale. That is, larger farms uh, mean a lower unit cost of production, at least up to a point. Uh, I'd like first to talk about specialized crop farming. And surprisingly, specialized crop farming was one of the first systems of agriculture uh, that we found in the Ozarks. Uh, as you recall, when we talked about settlement, uh, those uh, plan plantation owners or people with property who came from Kentucky and North Carolina and settled on the northern Ozark border uh, could afford the lands of three to five dollars an acre, and they brought their slaves with them and began to grow hemp and, and tobacco as the, as the uh, cash crops which they shipped out of the area. And there are still vestiges, at least, of tobacco growing. I'd like, if we could, to turn to a map uh, uh, that I've made uh, using census records, actually four maps. Uh, <clears throat> this shows hemp production using the census of 1860. You find that hemp, which is a fiber crop, uh, was grown on the, in the uh, southeastern Ozark counties. Uh, it was grown in Gasconade County and also in the Boone's Lick country to some extent. Already by 1860, hemp growing had declined and actually the Civil War put an end to hemp growing in the Ozarks and in Missouri in general for the most part because hemp was used in making the bags that cotton was uh, baled in and they were cut off from the supply. Then if we look at the map below, 
1890, we see that very little hemp was left. I suppose what hemp is grown there today is not recorded in the census because it is the cannabis plant or marijuana. It was brought in as a commercial crop, but it's no longer that, uh, that's no longer the case. Uh, tobacco growing, if we can look at this map, in 1860, tobacco was grown uh, widely. Uh, most of the commercial production was in the Boone's Lick country. Uh, now if we look at the situation in 1969, which th was the last agricultural census that I used, we still see some production in the Boone's Lick country. Uh, this tobacco is uh, hauled to Weston in uh, Platte County to be marketed. The production that you see here in the other sections of the Ozark it must be uh, Ozark region is uh, probably uh, some uh, garden plots that somebody has uh, plotted, but it is or planted, but it is recorded in the census. I'd like next to look at two slides, which will show uh, the vestiges of a couple of vestiges of this early activity. If we can have the first slide, then uh, this is a uh, hemp press on the Missouri River. Uh, no, no longer used, of course, but uh, it did require a great deal of uh, labor, and uh, slaves were used extensively, and the hemp was baled in, a, in large bales uh, in a press such as this and shipped down the river. In the next slide, if we can have this, this is uh, the um, tobacco auction at Weston, Missouri. Most of the tobacco, or all of the tobacco from, that is produced in the Ozarks and in the Missouri Valley go to this auction for uh, market. If it were not for government subsidies and acreage allotments, I suspect that tobacco growing would have ended in the Ozarks a good, a good many years ago. Well, uh, the primary, th these really were uh, rather fast passing uh, systems of farming with the exception of some vestiges of tobacco growing that goes on today. The main system of farming for the early pioneers was subsistence agriculture or pioneer subsistence agriculture which produced very little in the way of surpluses because markets were inaccessible except by flatboat and this meant uh, along the larger streams. The early exports of the area included things like bear oil, uh, hides, skins, uh, honey. Uh, very little land was cultivated. Uh, apparently uh, crop farming was an adjunct to uh, gathering of uh, materials from the forest, uh, foods, and uh, from hunting. Actually, uh, this is documented by Schoolcraft in his diary. In 1818, when he traveled through the White River country, he described the small patches of corn that the, farmer, that the settlers set out, uh, just enough for themselves and perhaps for some, uh, some of their livestock. The livestock were very much uh, foraged for themselves. Uh, also, the, uh, uh, they planted a bit of wheat, but very little, uh, simply enough for some white flour for biscuits and bread. Life for the Ozark pioneer was probably relatively simple compared to the hardships on the plains because there was timber, there was water, uh, and abundance of game and, and fish as well. Livestock was allowed to run open on the free range in the, uh, 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 in the forest. In fact, it wasn't until, the, until in the 1960s that Missouri had a... Uh, a, um, <clears throat> a state law prohibiting free range of, of livestock. Uh, counties had passed laws prohibiting free range of livestock uh, uh, earlier, but uh, the state didn't pass their law until the 1860s. Uh, corn was the leading crop, and really there was an amazing variety of crops that were raised. If we could have the s next slide then, we see, uh, simply go down the list here of crops in, in the census of 1850, and this is for the eight counties surrounding Springfield, and um, we see wheat, we see rye, we see Indian corn. Indian corn was by far the largest uh, crop grown or the most widely planted. Oats was grown, barley was grown, buckwheat was grown, um, flax was grown, tobacco, wool, which is not a crop but at least an agricultural product, hemp was grown, maple sugar shows up as being important enough uh, to show on the census of 1850. Beeswax and honey shows on the census. And then horses, asses and mules, milk cows, working oxen, surprisingly, over 9,000 working oxen in those eight counties in 1850. And this is a generation after settlement, the first settlement occurred and the land was opened. 
other cattle, I suppose, uh, meaning uh, nondescript uh, beef breeds, I suppose, sheep and swine. Uh, farming methods, likewise, were very crude. And uh, uh, the typical plow that they used if they, um, was what was known as a bull tongue plow. The, uh, this plow was a very simple thing. Here in this slide, we see uh, a, an improved form of a plow for opening ground. In the early days, they used oxen. And uh, here, they're using a mule. The bull tongue plow, they would, they would simply uh, plow a furrow. The first crop on new land was always corn. And they would drop the corn in a row and simply drag a log down the uh, furrow to cover the corn. Uh, Wheat was uh, customarily brushed in, as the, the saying was. Uh, they would plow the field, cast the wheat on the ground, and simply take a tree, a branch off a tree, and, and drag it around in order to cover the wheat with a thin covering of soil. No fertilizer was used, and uh, certainly uh, uh, even manures weren't used. In uh, Fairbanks, Fairbank and Tuck's uh, history of Greene County, they refer to the fact that uh, manures weren't uh, uh, taken out of the barns and distributed until on the fields until uh, land prices were increased. Uh, in, if we could see the next slide, uh, th I thought you might be interested in seeing this slide because it, it does show that uh, not all of the early uh, systems of farming are, have disappeared from the scene. This picture was taken very recently in Webster County, Missouri. The man is using what was known as a double shovel, what is known as a double shovel. It was the, the customary tool for plowing in corn and uh, cultivating corn, I should say. Uh, here he's using it to cultivate his uh, potato patch. Uh, this man told me that since tractors have come on the scene, the, uh, the uh, crops haven't been as good. If we can have the next slide then. Uh, this is an er early uh, uh, picture of an early uh, uh, sorghum mill in the Arcadia Valley. Uh, they were very self-sufficient. In the, in the next picture, we see another example of this. Uh, they called sorghum long sweetening, I suppose, because it took so long to pour it out of those jugs that you see in the foreground. Uh, they did try to become, or try to uh, be as self-sufficient as they could, or they had to be. In the next picture, we see sorghum making as it goes on today in the Ozarks. There is a bit of sorghum making <coughs> that still goes on, partly for the tourist trade and partly for local consumption. This picture was taken in Stone County. It's really very similar to the processes shown in the previous two pictures, except for the fact that uh, here they're using a um, tractor to power the mill that the cane sorghum is run through. Uh, the next system of farming that came on the scene was uh, general farming. Uh, this began around 1870 when railroads um, in it began to penetrate the Ozarks. Uh, it began, I suppose, a little earlier on the eastern borders and northern borders of the Ozarks and the few railroads that were built prior to 1870. Certainly in the Arcadia Valley, in the Bellevue Valley, in the St. Francis Mountains, uh, general farming began earlier because they could sell crops to the, or some of their surpluses to uh, the miners working in the old lead belt. Prior to the Ad, uh, the presence of good transportation, the only commercial system of agriculture was uh, livestock because they could drive both mules and, and uh, horses along with cattle to markets. Uh, some livestock, commercial livestock raising was possible. The transition to general farming was extremely rapid, uh, but especially so in the border districts where the soils were better. Again, the northern and eastern borders where the low essel soils were found, and in the Springfield Plain where the, spring, uh, the soils were better. Land subdivision went on extremely fast. Uh, by 1890, which was about the time that the maximum uh, farm population uh, uh, occurred, 40-acre farms were very common in the Springfield Plain. And 80-acre farms were considered to be uh, adequate to provide a fairly decent living, certainly not true today. Cattle and hogs were the main domestic animals. Uh, they raised a wide variety of animals in addition to cattle and hogs. Uh, again, a wide variety of crops. Uh, corn and wheat were the main crops, but uh, again, a wide variety of crops were raised. In fact, that was the idea. As one author put it, uh, uh, <clears throat> that general farming was to provide the farmer with more than one string for his bow. 
if he didn't make it with uh, one crop, he could make it with another crop, or if not with crops, he could make it with uh, livestock. Well, as land prices and uh, farming practices improved, manuring and, and breeding up of livestock followed along with uh, general farming. The demise of general farming came uh, as fast as it, as it uh, increased. Uh, uh, I have uh, some graphs, that are a graph here I'd like to show you. Uh, that I took this from the census materials. If you can come in very close on this graph, uh, this is for the eight county area around Springfield again, I, and this is between 1930 and 1964, which is the only period of time that the Census, kept, the census Bureau kept records of the types of farming. And this, gra this line here represents the, the number of, of general farms in 1930, and which was the earliest date already, I suppose, the general farm had begun to decline even by this time. But in 1930, in this eight county area, there were about 11,000 general farms. A generation later, in 1950, uh, 10,000 of those farms had passed from the scene. And in, by 1964, another 1,000 had passed from the scene. And there are only about 500 left in uh, 1964. You can see what happened as the general farm went out of the picture, the specialized farms came in. Uh, dairy farms were on, re increasing very rapidly during that same period of time. Uh, Part-time farming also uh, increased very rapidly, and livestock farming increased very rapidly. So the general farm really was not a competitive uh, type of farm. Now I'd like uh, next, if we could look at the, uh, at the first slide, of, uh, we have a series of slides here that represent some, some uh, activities uh, on general farms. This really sums it up here in this picture. Uh, uh, we have uh, livestock, uh, corn in the background, and the orchard. Uh, the idea was to have a diversity of crops. Here we see uh, mules uh, that were driven out of the Ozarks and out of the northern Ozark border, out of the Springfield vicinity. Mule raising and breeding was an important activity. They were driven into the plantations in Arkansas and Mississippi. This is a picture of mules that were driven into Arkansas. In the next picture, we see angora goats, which also came in during the general farming phase. Goats, in general, uh, were used as a management uh, for pasture. They, the, the expression, goading down pastures, uh, is an old Ozark uh, expression because this is the way pastures were managed. The persimmon sprouts and other sprouts were goaded down before the mowers, the brush hogs, and so forth were um, uh, invented. In fact, in the Ozarks today, uh, this region is the largest or second largest uh, producer of Angora goats in the United States. The other region is in West Texas in the Edwards Plateau. Uh, in this picture, we see haying activities during the general farming era. Of course, hay crops were important because of the livestock. In the next picture, we see simply an interesting haystack that uh, most of these, op th these operations were small scale. One of the things that uh, has happened uh, since uh, the general farm has gone from the scene is uh, there's been a decrease in the amount of uh, grains that have been grown. If we can see the next uh, slide then, we see corn production in 1919, which was perhaps near the, the summit or the crest of general farming. There's still a fair amount, of, by this time, there's still a fair amount of um, uh, corn grown in the Ozarks, uh, not an important uh, corn growing area compared to the Corn Belt to the north, of course, but a number of dots located there, and each of those dots represents 300,000 bushels of corn. In the next slide, we see wheat also as a major crop, particularly on the northern and western and eastern borders of the Ozarks in the better agricultural districts, but also in the interior Ozarks as well. Then if we can see the next slide, here we see uh, what corn as it appears, uh, and this wasn't the corn that was grown in the early days. This is a hybrid corn. The early corn was a open pollinated corn. Now, I'd, I'd like if we could come in and look at a map here very close. Uh, <clears throat> this is a modern or a map of the, uh, the situation as it occurs today. This is a map of uh, Missouri showing that corn is uh, grown almost uh, very little corn at all is grown in the interior counties of the Ozarks, as you can see in this map. Most of it is grown on the eastern, the northern, and the western borders. In fact, I took a traverse in uh, Logan Creek Valley in Reynolds County, which would be about here in the interior Ozarks. And along 17 miles in that valley, I found only 
15, 14, I believe, uh, cultivated acres of both corn and wheat. So there's very little corn grown in the interior Ozarks today. Now let me turn this around, and we see that the same is true for wheat, if you can come in very close on this. Uh, again, uh, wheat simply isn't grown to any degree at all in the interior Ozarks. It used to be much more important during the general farming stage. Still quite a lot of wheat grown on the eastern border and the northern border where German farmers are especially active in wheat growing and also in the western border where this is transitional to the uh, crop for the wheat growing area in Kansas. Also some of the newer crops, if you can hold it there just a moment and let me bring up another crop. Uh, this shows uh, oats which was much more important during the general farming era, but you can see here the interior Ozarks still uh, very little oats production. And another recent crop, uh, grain sorghums, uh, which has been added to the picture, mainly grown in the border districts again. Uh, if we can go back to this map again for just a moment, uh, there's one other recent crop that's been added and that is uh, soybeans. Uh, some soybeans grown in the western Ozarks and the northern Ozarks, but again, uh, hardly any production in the interior. The interior Ozarks really is a non-cultivated uh, region as far as crops are concerned. Then uh, quickly, if I can look at the next two slides, uh, this is for those of you who may not be acquainted with uh, agriculture that closely, this is what soybeans looks like. And in the next picture, we see grain sorghum or milo. The, most, uh, the first of the specialized crops to be introduced was uh, fruit growing. And fruit farms were, <coughs> uh, fruits, I, I should say, were brought into the Ozarks by the very first pioneers because it added to the diversity of their diets and it was a food that, crop that uh, could be grown. Uh, the kitchen orchard was nearly ubiquitous. Every farm had a kitchen orchard. If you recall earlier on the settlement patterns that I showed in an earlier lecture, we, uh, each farm had an orchard. Commercial fruit growing was promoted by the railroads to a large degree. And uh, large orchards were set out in the vicinity of Springfield, Republic, Marionville, West Plains. Uh, the period of important production was between 1910 and 1940 for the most part, when apples and cider uh, were shipped out of the Ozark region in fairly large quantities. The decline began in the early 1930s, and there were several reasons. Heavy freezes destroyed uh, a lot of the trees during the 1930s. There were disease problems, the codling moth or apple worm. Uh, there was a depressed econom economy during the 1930s. And then during the 40s, there was a shortage of labor as people could go to the defense plants and, and it was difficult to get labor to uh, harvest and prune and care for the trees. And simply then competition from better, uh, more specialized and uh, uh, regions and areas that had a competitive advantage over the Ozarks. Well. Uh, Fruit farming has, ex has come down to the present. There's still a bit of it in the Ozarks. Uh, some of it hangs on partly because the farmers have been able to uh, allow uh, people to come in and pick the fruit themselves and avoid some of the labor costs. We have better means of controlling uh, apple worms. And there's a certain inertia that goes with a, an apple orchard. That is, it's a fairly heavy investment, or a peach orchard for that matter too, any orcharding. And so uh, as a result then, uh, the uh, apple orchard or peach orchard is not uh, taken out of production as readily as, as other forms of crops. I'd like next, if we could, to look at some uh, slides of pictures. I obtained these from a, a horticultural report on the state of Missouri in 1913. It's an interesting book, all kinds of interesting information on the Ozarks and some extremely interesting maps. This shows the uh, <coughs> uh, production of apples, or excuse me, the uh, acreage of apples uh, in the Ozarks. Each dot there represents two acres of apples. And you can certainly see the proximity of those apples to the uh, rail lines, particularly the rail line leading from down the Ridge Road and the Memphis Run, the one leading into Arkansas. And then if we can have the next uh, slide, we see actual production of apples in 1913. And uh, each dot there represents a carload of apples. Actually, the apple production in the Ozarks was uh, relatively, uh, uh, the trees were relatively less productive than some of those in, the, in Buchanan County and Platte County along in, uh, the Missouri River in uh, the northern part of Missouri. 
the apples in, in the Ozarks were subject to freeze a good bit of the time. Uh, for instance, this year we have had an extreme amount of, uh, or a long period of fairly warm weather in the month of February, which um, it, these early w warm periods uh, often make the fruit bloom too early and then they will be frosted. So they really aren't as uh, safe. It isn't, although it's farther south, it isn't as safe for the raising of fruit as some places farther to the north. In the next picture, we see a map that shows uh, peaches, uh, acreages of peaches. And uh, we see here that uh, particularly in uh, uh, Howell County and, or and uh, Oregon County, uh, a large uh, concentration of peaches. Uh, West Plains and Koshkonong were important peach growing areas. And then if we can have the next slide. This is, I think, an interesting slide. In that t book that I mentioned, uh, the Horticultural Report of 1913 has maps for a great many counties in the Ozarks and in Missouri too, the rest of Missouri too, showing the specific acreages uh, by each square mile in the county. And this is Wright County, uh, which is east of Springfield along the Memphis, uh, Frisco line to Memphis. And it is very interesting that uh, each square mile, each square is a mile square there, that uh, about as far away from the railroad as orchards were established was seven or eight miles, an extremely close relationship between the location of the orchards and railroad production. The railroads did promote fruit growing. Uh, then if we could have the next slide, please. Here we see uh, early peach orchards that were set out, the picture taken in 1913. As you can see, this is quite a large orchard. Uh, in the next picture, uh, we see apple growing, <coughs> or uh, barreling of apples, in this case, uh, this was at Seymour, Missouri. Uh, the region had been known as the land of the big red apple, as you may be able to read on the slide. This was around 1905. The Volenweid family had uh, bought the orchards there from a man by the name of Cook. And today, this same orchard is in existence. Uh, it's owned by the Head family, which also owns uh, large orchards in the vicinity of uh, Marionville. In the next picture, we see uh, the Ozark Fruit Growers Association, one of their warehouses. They had a number of warehouses where the apples were, and peaches were sorted and graded and shipped out of the region by rail. In the next picture, if we could have the next slide, then we see apple barreling uh, seen at uh, Marionville. Marionville was known as the apple capital of Missouri and still claims that name. In the next picture, we see uh, hauling of peaches to market in a spatially constructed wagon so the peaches aren't crushed. and uh, next, we see spraying. They used arsenic of lead and various mixtures of sulfur in order to try to control the apple worm, only moderately successful. In the next picture, uh, we see early uh, heaters that they used to attempt to uh, keep the apples from being frozen. And in the next picture, we see an early or a present day addition to the uh, orchards, um, as the orchards are expanding to some extent. And in the next slide, we see a vestige of the early apple industry in Marionville, uh, the warehouse at Marionville, which was formerly an, a cooperative which shipped the apples out. And adjacent to that is, uh, in the next slide, we see the Spees Vinegar Company, which is just adjacent to it, which used apples. That concludes, then, the, lecture on, the first lecture on uh, farming in the Ozarks. In the next lecture, we'll be taking up some of the more recent agricultural activities. For course information concerning land and life in the Ozarks, contact Dr. Milton Rafferty, Department Head, Geography Geology, Southwest Missouri State University, Springfield, Missouri, 65802.